from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, which is the library's reading and literacy promotion arm. Uh, we operate through several vehicles. One is a national network of st affiliated state centers for the book. Another is a partnership of nonprofit organizations interested in reading, promoting reading, and another is with scholarly inter organizations interested in promoting the history of books. But today, we are featuring one of our best uh, and most well-known Library of Congress ways of promoting reading, and that is through the Books and Beyond author series, which has been underway now for several years, and it features authors of books that are, have a special connection with the Library of Congress. Uh, it can be using the collections of the Library of Congress, it can be working with a project with one of our divisions, or it can be an old friend from long ago that I made a promise to. This depends on what the situation is. Uh, here's the way that uh, it works. We do uh, videotape all of these for presentation on the Library of Congress's website. Uh, each of these uh, will last, last about an hour. Uh, but regarding the website, I do ask you then to turn off all things electronic. Uh, we will be uh, Featuring these broadcasts, the webcasts are also on a Books and Beyond Facebook page, and I have information about the Facebook page and also uh, the schedule of future events uh, on the back page, which you may want to take when you go out. Uh, the Facebook page lists recent talks, lists future talks, and gives people an opportunity to comment uh, to communicate with each other, and it also is the way that the easiest way, I think, to get back to see some of the past talks that we've had. So this is uh, one of the permanent ways that we're uh, trying to uh, provide a snapshot, I think, of writing and a snapshot of the wonderful books that are based largely on the Library of Congress's collections. Uh, I add that we do the same with the National Book Festival. I'm, the Center for the Book plays a major role in the festival, and, our, uh, and I, I am the author coordinator, so I've worked with the authors for many years, and we have been able to get uh, those 30-minute presentations by authors at the Book Festival up on the website as well. And that, if you go to this year, to the, uh, the new website, which we're just putting up for our September 25th National Book Festival, uh, you will see really more than 500 author presentations through the years. Wait a couple of weeks. We're reorganizing it, actually, but uh, it's going to be a wonderful resource. Uh, today, uh, the format will be uh, a presentation by our guest author, which you know about. Uh, that will last 20 or 25 minutes, an opportunity for questions and answers, and I must say because of uh, the website and extension of the picture through the website uh, that we welcome questions, but if you do ask a question, you've given us your permission to be perhaps be part of the future website, uh, and uh, that will be something you need to know about ahead of time. Uh, we will conclude, uh, as all do, all uh, Books and Beyond Talks do, uh, with a, a book sale and book signing for this book. And I'm happy to announce that today you can get a $5 discount. The publisher sells it for $35. We are selling it for $30. And our guest author will uh, be happy to sign, and the signing will all take place uh, here in this room. One of the nice things about Books and Beyond is that we always do them in cooperation with other divisions of the library. And in this case, our sponsor once again is the co-sponsor is the Manuscript Division. And I want to thank uh, Alice Burney, who will introduce our speaker. Alice is the literary and cultural historian of the Manuscript Division. I never quite get that full title, Alice, but I wrote it down this time. Uh, and I want to thank Alice and the Manuscript Division for bringing our speaker to us. And it's my pleasure to introduce Alice Burney. Alice, let's give her a hand.
Our author today is Martin Gardner, a freelance writer. He was born in Trenton, New Jersey, and now lives in Hastings on Hudson, New York. He earned an undergraduate degree from the College of New Jersey and a master's from the University of Virginia. He made his living as a career advertising copywriter for major agencies. On the side, he wrote articles for the Village Voice and other periodicals. Gradually, his true scholarly identity emerged from under the prevailing need to be practical. While still working in advertising, he managed to earn a PhD from New York University. His dissertation was the first doctoral thesis on the Marx Brothers films. That research led to the publication of the book we celebrate today. Mr. Gardner is a longtime Library of Congress researcher when he started using the library for his dissertation four decades ago. The manuscript division was in the Jefferson Building and, and researchers were not permitted to use the photocopy machine for archival material. But Mr. Gardner found a way. <laughs> Could he use his own photocopy machine if he had one? <laughs> yes. Well, Polaroid had just manufactured a tabletop box copier that used two light bulbs and their special Polaroid paper. So the library allowed him to bring in his own photocopier. This was the $40 precursor of the modern day scanner. What brought Martin to the Library of Congress? Primarily the Groucho Marx collection. What brought the Marx collection? A certain special letter celebrated and satirized in an interview between Groucho and Johnny Carson, with which some of you may be familiar. Um, and... Stick around for a while. This is dated, the, uh, the papers from the, from the Library of Congress. Louder. Library of Congress. <laughs> <clears throat> Dear Mr. Marks, and uh, so forth and so That's on me. and so on and so on and so on. From the Library of Congress, the letter is signed. I better find who sent this. L. Quincy Mumford. This is no laughing was, matter, that name. That's right. He's, Although it's reminiscent. He's the librarian of, of Congress. May I ask if you've made suitable, suitable provision for preserving your personal papers? If not, I invite you to consider the claims of the Library of Congress as an appropriate repository. In the library's manuscript division may be found many of the nation's manuscript treasures, including the personal papers of most of the presidents. This is all legitimate. Now the second. It show sure is. You forgive me for this kind of dialect. Who is? A little dialect. You. These distinguished collections would be enhanced by the addition of your papers. I invite you to present them to the American Don't people. Don't skim over it. I invite you to... Enunciate clearly. Excuse yeah. me, I'm sorry. I roll every vowel. Roll the vowels. All right. <laughs> I invite you to present them to the American people for inclusion in the National Library. If the invitation appeals to you, and I earnestly hope that it does, little parenthetical expression he put in, I shall be happy to provide further details. Meanwhile, I enclose an explanatory brochure for your information. Now read the next paragraph. <clears throat> the manuscript collections of the Library of Congress are composed of many millions of papers valuable to students of the American past. Here are the originals of the rough draft of the Declaration of Independence, George Washington's commission as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, the notes on the proceedings of the Constitutional Convention, the first telegraph message, the first and second drafts of the Gettysburg Address, the correspondence of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James... You don't have James to read the whole thing, Madison, that's the idea. Right? James Madison, that's rather impressive, Ulysses though, isn't it? Grant, Abraham Lincoln. You're going to mumble all through this thing? Now? <laughs> I think that is... Uh, well, it's an extraordinary. I was so astonished. When that I is... That, is that uh, interview was in uh, 1965. Uh, and played uh, in the head of our treasures exhibit for many years. Martin Gardner's book, The Marx Brothers as Social Critics, was published last year by McFarland and Company. And it looks at the serious critique of American culture that lay under the Marx Brothers slapstick and jokes. It examines historical events, political policy practices, economic conditions, manners, customs, literary subjects and popular entertainment as satirized in the films and considers the ways in which the films were relevant to their era and today. I'm pleased to present one of my most persistent and thorough researchers, Dr. Martin A. Gardner.
Hi. Um, I thank you, Alice, and thank you for the to the library for inviting me today. Uh, it gets me out of uh, having to sit there and work on my next book. <laughs> um, the the thing about uh, Groucho's papers is that they were were really helpful be because at that time there were no DVDs of the films. Uh, if I wanted to see a Marx Brothers film, I had to wait until I could find one at a movie theater, or maybe if I could find one on 16 millimeter uh, and find somebody that had a projector and all that kind of difficulty. Uh, I used to go to movies and watch the Marx Brothers and sit in the dark and try to take notes. Now I can watch in my living room and sit in the dark and take notes. Uh, uh, but uh, the one wonderful advantage in Groucho's papers is that he had, aside from his correspondence, which was hilarious uh, and very well written, uh, he also had shooting scripts of many of the films. Among them was Animal Crackers. Now, Animal Crackers at that time hadn't been shown for 30 years. It was just tied up in litigation. So there was no way to see it. I had read things about it. I had heard about it, but I couldn't see it. And the, the next best thing, of course, was to look at the shooting script, which was a, a, a really big help for me. Uh, so today, I'm going to show some clips. Uh, this is not a documentary. They're short clips. Some of them only run eight seconds, but they make the point of, uh, illustrate the point of some of the things that I'll be talking about. Um, the, um, and the reason for that is that we're going to have a question and answer session at the end. Uh, and I want to try to do that because people love to ask questions about the Marsh Brothers and hopefully I can answer them. I should be able to. Uh, so to begin, uh, I can tell you that there are two questions that most people ask, or many people ask, and one of them is, were they really brothers? And the answer is yes. And the second question is, did they make up that stuff on the screen? Was it all ad lib? The answer was no. They were scripts, they were carefully written, and rewritten, and rewritten, and rewritten, and rewritten. This is Hollywood. They're still rewriting it. Um, so um, there, were, there were five brothers. Uh, uh, they were uh, Leonard, Adolf, I'm sorry, can you not hear me? Uh, Leonard, Adolf, Julius, Milton, and Herbert. Well, what that means is Chico, Harpo, Groucho, Gummo, and Zeppo. Who ever heard of Gummo Marx? No one ever saw him in films because he wasn't in the films. Uh, he left the act uh, around World War I um, because he, two reasons. One, he wasn't very good, and his mother told him so. <laughs> uh, and the second reason was he wasn't really interested. He, he was more interested in being in business. So um, they actually started in show business around 1903, uh, Groucho, Harpo, and Chico, and they called themselves the Three Mascots. They were, they were a singing act, and Gummo joined the act shortly after that, so they called themselves the Four Nightingales. Um, fortunately, they could count to four. Uh, uh, and they were strictly a singing act, and, and then they kind of uh, changed into uh, a, a schoolroom act. Uh, in, in vaudeville in those days, there were a lot of schoolroom acts, a teacher and students, and teacher would ask questions, the students would answer, and somehow it all be jokes. Um, they got their material by stealing material from other acts, and other acts got their material from stealing from the Marx Brothers. So they, none of them could afford to hire professional writers. Uh, so that's what they did. They did the best they could. And typical of the kind of jokes that they would use um, is where Groucho, who was always the school teacher, and 
Chica, who was always the, the dumb immigrant, and Harpo, who was the silent buffoon, if you will. So Groucho would look at Chico and say, what's the shape of the world? Chico would look at him and say, I, I don't know. Well, OK, what's the shape of my cufflinks? Oh, they're squared. What's the shape of my cufflinks on Sunday? <laughs> they're round. Then what's the shape of the world? Square on weekdays, round on Sundays. <laughs> so typical jokes that they would use. They weren't very, weren't very good. They were sort of funny uh, and kind of crude. Um, they uh, decided and they kept pushing to try to get to Broadway. I mean, who doesn't want to get to Broadway? Yes, they did play in and around New York, but not the big time. Um, it took them 15 years until they got, they managed to get a Broadway show. Uh, they had met some man in Pittsburgh who owned a furniture store. Uh, he had a girlfriend, of course, which he wanted to get, who he wanted to get on stage. Uh, and he somehow he came up with some sets. I guess he must have taken some of the furniture that he couldn't sell. And uh, they found a writer, a man named Will Johnstone, who worked for a newspaper in New York, and they wrote a show called I'll Say She Is. Um, Sam Harris, who was a very successful Broadway producer, saw the show. He liked it a lot. Uh, the brothers were just tearing around the stage and really tearing it apart, physically tearing it apart. People would go see the Marx Brothers because it was a different show every night even though it was supposed to follow a script. Uh, they would wreck the furniture, they'd wreck the scenery, and do all kinds of things. Harpo one time jumped onto the curtain as it was rising for the next act because he saw a pretty girl sitting in a box seat, and he rode up and hung over the edge of the box seat and got her phone number. So, I mean, they would do things like that. Um, and so Harris wanted to produce a show. He called up uh, George Kaufman, who was the, the most famous uh, satirical writer of musical comedies in America and director. And he was also a film critic for the, for the New York Times. He's a busy guy. He, uh, and he said to Kaufman, go see the Marx Brothers. Kaufman did, and he didn't want to do the show. Uh, he agreed to do it only if Sam Harris would keep the brothers from going wild. Uh, so he, uh, he went ahead and agreed to it. Uh, they, he, he decided he was going to write a show about the Florida land boom. The Florida land boom was as devastating as, um, as Madoff is today. Um, the, he, he hired a, a, another writer named Maury Riskind, who was a comedy writer and who specialized in writing blackouts. I don't know if you know what a blackout is, but it's a, it's a technique in which the comic tells a joke and all the lights go out, and the audience is sitting in the dark laughing, and when the lights come up again, there's a new act on. It's, S somewhat similar to, they, they still use it, somewhat similar to the ending of the Sopranos series where, the, where Tony was sitting there with the family having dinner and suddenly the screen goes black. It was the end of the sequence and it was the end of the series. Um, so they wrote Kaufman, uh, I'm sorry, they <laughs> wrote The Coconuts and it was a smash success on Broadway ran for two years, and they wrote the, ne the next play, which was uh, Animal Crackers, having to do with uh, Long Island society and, uh, and the uh, trappings thereupon. Uh, meanwhile, Paramount Films, sensing and knowing that sound films were gonna be the wave of the future, sent out scouts to beat the bushes uh, to try to find comics who could talk, and usually uh, either two or three, as opposed to a single comic. Uh, so they went to legitimate theater, they went to 
to uh, vaudeville, they went to uh, musical comedy, wherever they could find anything. And they signed the Marx Brothers to do five pictures. First one they did was Coconuts. Um, and it was, a, it was a natural for them because the brothers, uh, as well as Kaufman, uh, were skeptical of everything. I mean, they deflated pomposity. They were irreverent, to say the least. Uh, and they, uh, they knocked social habits. Kaufman had greater themes in mind, of course, than, than uh, uh, square on Saturday, square on weekdays, and round on Sundays. He would, he would talk about uh, taxes and about big business and Hollywood and the Senate and uh, even the presidency. I mean, he, he really didn't care. Um, so the, 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 uh, the importance of, of the coconuts uh, was bifold, actually. One was that this was an early sound film. Uh, and secondly, the Marx Brothers, although it was full of puns and wisecracks, the Marx Brothers burst onto the screen like no other comics ever had before. Yes, there was Chaplin. Yes, there was Keaton. Yes, there was Harold Lloyd. But their comedy was, although it was socially oriented, was pretty gentle stuff. The brothers just didn't care. Um, uh, they cared about what they were doing, but the, everything was fair game, especially language. So let's take a, take a look at a little bit of the coconuts. And here where you have uh, the, the, the Florida land boom in which salesmen uh, would, would uh, come, came to Florida and they were high pressuring people to buy land. They were buying undeveloped land. Sometimes the same piece of property would sell four times in one day. Oftentimes you'd buy a piece of land and you'd discover that it's a mile and a half into the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, they were that uh, devious about it. Um, fast talking, hard sell, and they and uh, Groucho, Groucho does the same with Margaret Dumont. Uh, it's the first time she appears in a film with them. So let's see what happens. How do you do, Mr. Hemmer? Why don't you whistle at the crossing? You're just the woman I'm looking for. Now, whether you like it or not, I'm going to tell you about Florida real estate. It's the first time it's ever been mentioned out here today. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid. Uh, uh, do you know that property values have increased 1929 since 1,000%? Do you know that this is the biggest development since Sophie Tucker? Do you know that Florida is the show spot of America and Coconut Beach is the black spot of Florida? You told me about this yesterday. I know, but I left out a comma. Look, in a little while, we're going to hold an auction sale at Coconut Manor. The suburb terrible, uh, beautiful. You must come over. There's going to be entertainment, sandwiches, and the auction. If you don't like auction, we can play a uh, contract. Here it is, Coconut Manor. 42 hours from Times Square by railroad. 1,600 miles as the crow flies. 1,800 as the horse flies. There you are, Coconut Manor. Glorifying the American sewer and the Florida sucker. Why, it's the most exclusive residential district in Florida. Nobody lives there. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I don't know if you if you if you heard it or it went by too quickly, but there you have a typical inversion of language. Uh, it's where uh, Groucho says, "Do you know that property values have increased 1929 since 1,000 <laughs> percent?" Well, that's what he says. What we hear in our mind is, "Do you know that property values have increased a thousand percent since 1929?" That's what we want to hear, but that's not what he says. Um, and uh, he he then gets people to come to the auction. Let's get the auction started before we get a tornado. Right this way. Step forward, everybody. Friends, you are now in Coconut Manor, one of the finest cities in Florida. Of course, we still need a few finishing touches, but who doesn't? This is the heart of the residential district. Every lot is a stone's throw from the station. As soon as they throw enough stones, we're going to build a station. 800 wonderful residences will be built right here. Why, they're as good as up. Better. You can have any kind of a home you want to. You can even get stucco. Oh, how you can get stucco. Now is the time to buy while the new boom is on. Remember that old saying? A new boom sweeps clean. And don't forget the guarantee. My personal guarantee. If these lots don't double in value in a year, I don't know what you can do about it. <laughs> uh, 
And as I say, there's the, always the element of romance with, with Margaret. Uh, and uh, here we see Groucho um, uh, talking with her, and he, she understands very quickly exactly what he has in mind. I love you. I love you. Can't you see how I'm pining for you? What in the world is the matter with you? Oh, I, I'm not myself tonight. I don't know who I am. One false move and I'm yours. I love you. I love you anyhow. I don't think you'd love me if I were poor. I might, but I keep my mouth shut. There's also the element of Victorian romance, which they tear, they tear apart. And uh, oftentimes, uh, the, the, what would happen is um, that women would offer their boyfriends a lock of their hair as a little symbol. It's sort of like a fraternity pin. Um, let's see what, what happens here. Oh, uh, I suppose you'll think me a sentimental old fluff, but... Uh... Would you mind giving me a lock of your hair? A lock of my hair? Oh, I, I had no idea. I'm letting you off I... easy. I was going to ask for the whole wig. <laughs> my, my favorite love scene is... Uh, my favorite one is uh, the, the one where Groucho cuts right through all the sentiment and gets right to what he wants. Not that I care, but where is your husband? Why, he's dead. I'll bet he's just using that as an excuse. I was with him till the very end. Hmm, no wonder he passed away. I held him in my arms and kissed him. Oh, I see. Then it was murder. Will you marry me? Did he leave you any money? Answer the second question first. He left me his entire fortune. Is that so? Can't you see what I'm trying to tell you? I love you. Oh, your excellency. You're not so bad yourself. So his comments are not really uh, insults toward any woman in particular. They're really a comment on courtly and sentimental love. Uh, and um, we, we come to that realization if we see it enough times. Um, they also comment on the simple social niceties uh, that we all go through. The, the um, here, let me hold the door for you. Oh, thank you. Uh, that, that kind of thing. But what happens is, and if you think carefully, this is what people do today, uh, someone says, someone thanks you for something, and your response is not, you're welcome, but thank you. So it's, uh, thank you, ah, thank you. And uh, let's see this. Here we have Groucho uh, in his hotel room. Uh, he's about to have a tryst uh, with, with uh, um, es Esther Muir, who was a big blonde beauty, uh, and he preens and gets himself ready for this thing, and she comes to the door, and he holds open, holds open the door for her. Oh, and I've got, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, I got the wrong one here. No, I went. I, I have to back up. Sorry, I, I did have the wrong slide. This is a, a slide in which we talk about introductions, where people introduce each other, and you saw some of it. Uh, we got it up. Okay. Oh, Mr. Driftwood. Ah, Gottlieb, uh, allow me. Uh, Mrs. Claypool, Mr. Gottlieb. Mr. Gottlieb, Mrs. Claypool. Mrs. Claypool, Mr. Gutley. Mr. Gutley, Mrs. Claypool. Mrs. Claypool, I could go on like this all night, but it's tough on my suspenders. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. Mrs. Claypool, Mr. Gutley, Mr. Gutley, Mrs. Claypool, Mrs. Claypool, Mr. Gutley, Mr. Gutley, Mr. Claypool. Now, if you four people want to play bridge, don't mind me. Go right ahead. Uh, and now we're going to see the, the business about thank you, thank you, where he, he's preparing for his meeting with this woman. <laughs> Who 
is it? Just a moment, fruitcake. Yes? Oh, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Do you like gardenias? I adore them. How did you know? I didn't, so I got you forget-me-nots. One whiff of this and you'll forget everything. <laughs> Won't you sit down? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, do you mind? Not at all. I always take the rap. <laughs> You're such a charming host. The heckin' wishes were all like that. How about a short beer? Nothing, thank you. Thank you. In this, this scene, which lasts six minutes, they have the thank you, thank you routine seven times. Um, it, it, it's, uh, uh, it's something that uh, Hayakawa, the, the, the uh, uh, semanticist, calls pre-symbolic language. And what he's talking about is the fact that we're not supposed to take the words literally, but rather for the meaning of the sounds. Um, uh, uh, you know, how are you? How are you? How are you? How are you? It's not, it's not the words that are important, but it's the, it's the gesture involved. There's a scene in, in uh, Animal Crackers where Groucho was introduced to a woman and he says, how are you? And she says, how are you? He says, how are you? That leaves me one up. So <laughs> it's, it's, they, they, the words don't matter. Um, there's an, something else that happened in the 1920s called companionate marriage. A judge in Denver, uh, whose name was Ben Lindsay, uh, had thought that one solution to a problem that young people were having is uh, to have something which he called companionate marriage. Problem was that after World War I, uh, we were in a, a, uh, an inflationary mode. It was, it was so terrible that young people had to delay getting married. They just couldn't afford to set up housekeeping. Uh, as much as they wanted to get married, they just couldn't afford it. So he came up with the idea of saying, well, if the two people are in agreement, we'll have a trial marriage. Uh, they can live together as man and wife, and to, to cut expenses, they can live with his family for a while, and then perhaps live with her family, and back and forth. And this caused a tremendous sensation, um, because it was really a change in in the culture and a change in way people thought about marriage. Let's, so let's see how Groucho and the Marx Brothers handle that. What do you say, uh, are we all going to get married? All of us? All of us. But that's big of me. Yes, and that's big of me too. It's big of all of us. Let's be big for a change. I'm sick of these conventional marriages. One woman and one man was good enough for your grandmother, but who wants to marry your grandmother? Nobody, not even your grandfather. Think, think of the honeymoon, strictly private. I wouldn't let another woman in on this. Well, maybe one or two, but no men. I may not go myself. Are you suggesting companionate marriage? Well, it's got its advantages. You could live with your folks, and I could live with your folks. And you, you could sell fuller brushes. <laughs> Um, in that period, of course, we were in, uh, we were in uh, uh, the Prohibition era, and one of the things that was uh, quite prevalent, of course, were speakeasies. Um, the, um, the, uh, the whole s social structure of a speakeasy, of course, was that it was, it was a, an illicit way to sell booze, uh, and the structure was that you would go to the speakeasy, knock on the door, show your membership card, or give a password, and then you'd be allowed to enter. Um, Groucho in Horse Feathers uh, decides to go to a speakeasy to recruit a couple of football players uh, so that 
uh, they could play and perhaps win the big Thanksgiving Day game against their rival college. Uh, that's, um, there's also the element of, um, of, um, of illicit booze. Um, the oftentimes speakeasy owners would, would uh, make their own booze to, to cut costs and, and uh, uh, generate more profit. So uh, in, this, in this sequence, we see Chico uh, as a, uh, an ice man. Hello? Yes, lady, this is Barra Villa, the ice man, is speaking. What do you want? One, one quarter scotch, one quarter rye. Wait a minute, so hold on, I see if I got him. One quarter scotch, one quarter rye. Okay, lady, I sent him right over. The suggestion there is that people didn't really care what kind of booze it was. They were more interested in the end effect. Um, and of course, as I say, we have the element of the password. Who are you? I'm fine, thanks. Who are you? I'm fine too, but you can't come in unless you give the password. Oh, what is the password? Oh, no, you got to tell me. Hey, I tell what I do, I give you three guesses. It's the name of a fish. Is it Mary? Ha <laughs> ha! That's an old fish. She isn't. Well, she drinks like one. Let me see. Is it Sturgeon? Hey, you crazy. Sturgeon, he's a doctor. Cuts you open when you're sick. Now, I give you one more chance. I got it. Haddock. That's a funny. I got a haddock, too. What do you take for a haddock? Well, now, sometimes I take aspirin, or sometimes I take a calomel. Say, I'd walk a mile for a calomel. You mean chalk or calomel. I like that, too. But you know, get... <laughs> A lot of these things, they used a lot of vaudevillian kind of puns, uh, um, haddock and, and caramel, and, but it, it went all throughout all of the films. Um, hand in hand with the, with the prohibition, uh, we had the terrible event of the stock market crash shortly followed by the economic depression of the 1930s. Um, when the market crashed, Fortunes were lost. I mean, really, fortunes were lost. Even stockbrokers were broke. Mm -hmm. uh, here is how the brothers distilled that, if you will. Well, of all the colossal impudence. Why don't you stand up? Can't you see he has no chair? Well, uh, you... You better keep quiet. We're a couple of big stockholders in this company. Stockholders, huh? Well, you look like a couple of stowaways to me. Well, don't forget, my fine fellow, that the stockholder of yesteryear is the stowaway of today. Well, you look exactly like... <laughs> the bro this is from, this is from uh, Monkey Business, where the brothers are stowaways on a ship, and they're running around. The important part for them is food, because as stowaways, they don't get to eat. So Chico and Groucho have stolen into the captain's cabin and ordered his lunch to be brought to them, of course, and the captain comes in and finds them. Um, as far as the Depression goes, the films didn't really dwell on it. They made some sly references. Most films didn't talk about the Depression uh, because people went to the films, went to movies, to escape the Depression. Uh, they went uh, to feel good about themselves, to laugh. Uh, for uh, an hour or so, and then go back to the grinding numbness of the Depression. Um, so that any references in, uh, in the Marx Brothers about the Depression were pretty slight. Um, let's see one little one where, with Groucho talking about income. Three months ago, you promised to put me into society. In all that time, you've done nothing but draw a very handsome salary. You think that's nothing, huh? How many men do you suppose are drawing a handsome salary nowadays? Why, well, you can count them on the fingers of one hand, my good one. 
um, even even uh, wealthy people were no longer financially solid, especially nouveau riche, the ones who had made the money in the stock market. Uh, and we'll see uh, what happens with Groucho and Margaret Dumas. But I never made a speech in my life. All right, I'll take care of it. You. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I guess that takes in most of you. This is the opening of a new opera season. A season made possible by the generous checks of Mrs. Claypool. I am sure the familiar strains of Verdi's music will come back to you tonight. And Mrs. Claypool's checks will probably come back in the morning. So, uh, no, no one was immune to the problem. Um, they also uh, had a great deal uh, in, in their films about, about the law, about lawyers, about contracts, about letter writing, um, and we can see some of those in these clips to follow. Two beers, bartender. I'll take two beers, too. Well, things seem to be getting better around the country. I don't know how I'm a stranger here myself. Don't try to hide. I know you're in that closet. Did you see me go in the closet? No. Am I in the closet now? Well, no. Then how do you know I was in the closet? Your Honor, I rest my case. Come here, brown eyes. Oh, no. You're not going to get me off this bed. I didn't know you were a lawyer. You're awfully shy for a lawyer. You bet I'm shy. I'm a shyster lawyer. Uh, the um, the thing about letter writing is is uh, an important theme here, uh, uh, tied in with with lawyers and obfuscatory language. And let's see what happens when Groucho wants to write a letter to his lawyers. Sure, you a thing of three. Okay. Oh, Sending for the police. Take that to my lawyers. Sending for the police, eh? I say, take that to my lawyers. Well, I am taking it. Uh, read me what you have so far. Honorable Charles H. Uh, Hungerdunger. Care of Hungerdunger, 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 and McCormick. Semicolon. How do you spell semicolon? All right, make it a comma. Honorable Charles H. Hungerdunger, Care of Hungerdunger, Hungerdunger, and McCormick. Gentlemen, question mark. Uh, do you want that uh, <clears throat> in the letter? No, put that in an envelope. Now then. In Ray Yours of the Fifth Inst, yours to hand and beg to rep, brackets, that uh, we have gone over the ground carefully and we seem to believe, i.e., to wit, e.g., in lieu, that uh, despite all our precautionary measures which have been involved, we seem to believe that it is hardly necessary for us to proceed unless we uh, receive an ipso facto that is not negligible at this moment, quotes, unquotes, and quotes. Uh, hoping this finds you, I beg to remain... Hoping this finds him where? Well, let him worry about that. Don't be so inquisitive, Jamison. Sneak. I say, hoping this finds you, I beg to remain as of June 9th, cordially yours regards. That's all, Jamison. Uh, there's also... Um a scene uh, where they uh, get into uh, writing contracts, and this one is uh, a little long, but it makes its point very well. Now pay particular attention to this first clause because it's most important. <clears throat> it says the, uh, the party of the first part should be known in this contract as the party of the first part. How do you like that? That's pretty neat, eh? No, it's no good. What's the matter with her? I don't know. Let's hear it again. It says the, uh, the party of the first part should be known in this contract as the party of the first part. Yeah, it sounds a little better this time. Well, it grows on you. Would you like to hear it once more? Uh, just the first part. What do you mean? The, the party of the first part? No, the first part of the party of the first part. All right. It says the... Uh, the first part of the party of the first part should be known in this contract as the first part of the party of the first part 
She'll be known in this contract. Look, why should we quarrel about a thing like this? We'll take it right out, huh? <laughs> it's a too long anyhow. Now what do we got left? Well, I got about a foot and a half. Now it says the, the party of the second part should be known in this contract as the party of the second part. Well, I don't know about that. Now what's the matter? I don't like the second party either. Well, you should have come to the first party. We didn't get home till around four in the morning. I was blind for three days. Hey, look. Why can't the first part of the second party be the second part of the first party? Then you've got something. Well, look, uh, rather than go through all that again, what do you say? Fine. Now, uh, now I've got something here you're bound to like. You'd be crazy about it. No, I don't like it. You don't like what? Whatever it is, I don't like it. Well, don't let's break up an old friendship over a thing like that. Ready? Okay. Now, the next part I don't think you're going to like. Well, your word's good enough for me. Now then, is my word good enough for you? I should say not. Well, that takes out two more clauses. Now, the party of the eighth part... No, you, no? that's no good, no. The party of the ninth... No, part, that's no. no good, too. Hey, how is it my contract is skinnier than yours? Well, I don't know. You must have been out on the tail last night. But anyhow, we're all set now, aren't we? Oh, sure. Now, just, uh, just you put your name right down there, and then the deal is, is uh, legal. Hey, I forgot to tell you, I can't write. Well, that's all right. There's no ink in the pen anyhow. But listen, it's a contract, isn't it? Oh, sure. We've got a contract, You'll no matter wait. how small it is. Hey, wait, wait. What does this say here, this thing here? Oh, that? Oh, that's the usual clause. That's in every contract. That just says, uh, it says, uh, if any of the parties participating in this contract are shown not to be in their right mind, the entire agreement is automatically nullified. Well, I don't know. It's all right. That, that's in every contract. That's, that's what they call a sanity clause. <laughs> you can't fool me. There ain't no sanity clause. So they re revert to a pun to get out of the scene. And it's, um, in the 1920s, Eugene O'Neill introduced a new way uh, of seeing plays uh, to American theater. Uh, the characters are introspective and they speak their inner thoughts about other characters right out loud to the audience. Um, the, uh, the play that he wrote that introduced that idea was called Strange Interlude. And uh, let's see what, how Groucho in, in Animal Crackers, uh, of course written by Kaufman uh, and Riskin, uh, handles that. Fascinated. I'm fascinated too. Right on the arm. Fascinated. Wim wham. If I were Eugene O'Neill, I could tell you what I really think of you two. You know, you're very fortunate the Theatre Guild isn't putting this on. And so is the Guild. Pardon me while I have a strange interlude. Why, you couple of baboons? What makes you think I'd marry either one of you? Strange how the wind blows tonight. It has a thin, eerie voice that reminds me of poor old Mosden. How happy I could be with either of these two if both of them just went away. <laughs> Theodore Dreiser in the 1920s wrote a novel which was a, a bestseller and was then turned into a, a play and then a movie called An American Tragedy, and it's been done and redone many times since. Even, even to this day, occasionally, you find someone doing a version of it. Uh, Woody Allen did one a few years ago. Um, the play is a, if we were to put it in modern terms, it's a play about upward mobility and about murder, of course. Uh, a young man named Clyde Griffiths, um, is uh, trying to succeed in life. He gets uh, a woman pregnant, uh, and he doesn't want to marry her, uh, or even acknowledge that she's pregnant. So he takes her out uh, for a canoe ride. Um, and uh, he uh, basically pushes her into the lake. He hits her across the face with his camera. She falls in the lake. He knows that she can't swim, and he lets her drown. Uh, he um, goes to trial, of course, and he's found guilty. 
Um, in Horse Feathers, you have Groucho in a canoe with Thelma Todd. And it's interesting, she's doing the rowing and he's sitting strumming a guitar, singing to her. And they make a reference to, or he does, makes a reference um, to the American tragedy. Um, and it's in a canoe and it's not the safest kind of vehicle to be in. If any of you have been in a canoe, they're a little rickety, especially when you stand up. Um, so uh, let's see what happens here. You know, this is the first time I've been out in a canoe since I saw the American tragedy. Oh, you're perfectly safe, Professor, in this boat. I don't know. I was going to get a flat bottom, but the girl at the boathouse didn't have one. Uh, an ambiguous statement, a reference to it. Um, it's interesting that in the film, uh, uh, Thelma does fall into the lake. She does know how to swim. She falls into the lake. And she looks up at him and she says, uh, would, would you throw me a lifesaver? And he reaches in his pocket, takes out a roll of lifesavers and throws her one. Uh, the, uh, uh, in the 1930s, uh, the countries all over the world were faced with the problem of not being able to pay uh, their reparations uh, uh, and debts uh, incurred during World War I. Um, they tried all kinds of maneuvers uh, to make that happen, but it was, it was, uh, uh, it was a shambles. I mean, it just nothing was working. Um, so um, um, international politics were fragile, to say the least. Duck Soup, uh, the film that the brothers made in 1933, was a comment on the, the, on those kind of politics and. Uh, on, on spying that went along between, between countries uh, or among countries, and of course, war. Um, in the film, Groucho is the uh, president of a, a country called Fredonia, um, and Chico and Harpo have been hired by a neighboring country to spy on Groucho. Of course, they don't really succeed, and Chico has a glib answer for every single question about that. Now, Ciccolini, I want a full detailed report of your investigation. All right, I tell you. Monday, we watch the Firefly's house, but he no come out. He wasn't home. Tuesday, we go to the ball game, but he fool us. He no show up. Wednesday, he go to the ball game, or we fool him. We no show up. Thursday was a doubleheader. Nobody show up. Friday, it rained all day. There was no ball game. So we stayed home. We listened to her over the radio. Then you didn't shadow Firefly. Oh, sure, we shadow Fire. We shadow him all day. But what day was that? Saturday. <laughs> it's some joke, eh, boys? Uh, the final scene of the film uh, has to do with war. But uh, before that, Groucho prompts the war. He, he engenders the war by, um, with, with, uh, his 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 paranoia uh, when he when he completely destroys international relations between Fredonia and Sylvania within in less than sixty seconds he goes from being a um, being a at, at the height rather of international cooperation. Uh, to uh, the severance of relations and absolute war. I've taken the liberty of asking the ambassador to come over here because we both felt that a friendly conference would settle everything peacefully. He'll be here any moment. Mrs. Teasdale, you did a noble deed. I'd be unworthy of the high trust that's been placed in me if I didn't do everything within my power to keep our beloved Fredonia at peace with the world. I'd be only too happy to meet Ambassador Trentino and offer him on behalf of my country the right hand of good fellowship. And I feel sure that he will accept this gesture in the spirit in which it is offered. But suppose he doesn't. A fine thing that'll be. I hold out my hand and he refuses to accept it. That'll add a lot to my prestige, won't it? Me, the head of a country snubbed by a foreign ambassador. Who does he think he is that he can come here and make a sap out of me in front of all my people? Think of it. I hold out my hand and that hyena refuses to accept it. Why, the cheap four flushing swine, he'll never get away with it, I oh. tell you. He'll never oh, get away with it. Please. 
within a couple of seconds, they declare war. Uh, and the film ends with, uh, with the, uh, uh, the, right at the battlefront where Groucho is not only the president of the country and the, the commander in chief of all the military, he's also the field commander. And he's there giving orders and making jokes and uh, um, they, it, it, it's, it's, it's really absurd, it's surrealistic, they're wearing all different kinds of uniforms from different eras, eras of time. Uh, at one point, Groucho is wearing a colonial uh, soldier's coat and a Civil War uh, foot soldier's hat, and uh, whereas the, the other men are wearing uh, World War I French soldier's uniforms. So. Let's see what happens. Uh, this is just a short version of that scene. They're all wires. The enemy has captured Hill 2728, throwing 13 hillbillies on a white. Last night, two snipers crept into our machine gun nest and laid an egg. Send reinforcements immediately. Send it off collect. Your Excellency. Our men are being badly beaten in open warfare. I suggest we dig trenches. Dig trenches? With our men being killed off like flies, there isn't time to dig trenches. We'll buy them ready-made. Here, run out and get some trenches. Yes, sir. Wait a minute. Get them this high and our soldiers won't need any pants. Yes, sir. Wait a minute. Get them this high and we won't need any soldiers. Yes, sir. Ciccolini, your partners deserted us, but I was still counting on you. There's a machine gun nest near Hill 28. I want it cleaned out. All right, I'll tell the janitor. Message from the front, sir. Oh, I'm sick of messages from the front. Don't we ever get a message from the side? What is it? General Smith reports a gas attack. He wants to know what to do. Tell him to take a teaspoonful of bicarbonate soda and a half a glass of water. Yes, sir. Um, so it, it, it's interesting that here in the United States, when that film was released, many people thought and misinterpreted it. Many people thought it was an attack on uh, Franklin Roosevelt and his attempt to um, solidify the, the economy, um, but in fact, in Europe, they got the message quite well. Um, Benito Mussolini was so angry when he saw Duck Soup that he banned it in Italy. He, he called the Marx Brothers exemplars of the full flower of anti-fascist culture. Of course, we all know who had the last laugh. Uh, uh, Duck Soup and the other Marx Brothers Films have lasted uh, uh, ever since then. Um, and Mussolini only lasted 12 years. Um, so the significance of all of these films is that um, they, the, the, the subject matter that they covered still remains relevant in the 21st century. Um, they, the importance is that um, they, they are just, it's just, timeless cultural realizations. Uh, even the most innocent jokes in there uh, uh, are, are part of social criticism. Uh, we get the point. We understand that what these films really mean beneath all the laughter. Thank you. I, I um, uh, there's, um, there's, I, I call my book, uh, I use the phrase social, uh, excuse me, comic nihilism. I'm wondering if anybody can define what nihilism is in six words or less or within 60 seconds. Uh, don't try. Let's let Groucho do it. He always has the last word anyway. I don't know what they have to say. It makes no difference anyway. Whatever it is, I'm against it. No matter what it is or who commenced it, I'm against it. Your proposition may be good, but let's have one thing understood. Whatever it is, I'm against it. And even when you've changed it or condensed it, I'm against it. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
if there's time, or do we have any time? We have time now only for a couple of questions. Okay. Um, we have to cut it down. Uh, so just raise your hand. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I know some of you still will make before the Fifth Hollywood production code when it into effect. But if it went into effect, could they have problems with uh, you know, the Hollywood uh, code and all that? Uh, oh, sure. Absolutely. I'm going to repeat the question for people who can't hear it. Um, did, did the brothers have trouble with a Hollywood production code? Um, but there was none at that time. Is that? Is that no, some of the films were before. Some were before and some were, okay, Martin. Well, they, they, they did have problems with it, but the, the writers were smart enough to get around the problems before they, before they intruded. For example, um, one of the ways they got around it was with Groucho's facial expressions. Um, if I were to say to you, sir, let's have lunch, a simple invitation. If I said to you, let's have lunch, it means something different, or it could. So it, it's that kind of thing. He didn't say a word. You know, if I said to you, let's go to bed, okay, let's go to bed, it means something different. So that's one way they got around it. Uh, other ways they got around it were with ambiguous puns. I asked the girl uh, for a, a flat bottom, but she didn't have one, you see. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's marginal. I mean, in that scene with Groucho, with, with Esther Muir, where he's, where he's dancing around, well, at one point, he holds her very close, and she says, closer, closer. And he says, if I was any closer, I'd be behind you. Well, the suggestion there is, could be interpreted as a sexual reference. Um, uh, so that's how they got around it. Another, another question? Yes. yes. Were there any uh, groups or individuals that had protests or warnings against or Did any groups or individuals protest against the Marx Brothers? Uh, uh, I don't know about individuals. I know that at one point, some of the theater owners were, who were forced to take the films uh, didn't really like them. They would refer to them as the Wisecrack Brothers. Um, they just thought that they were silly. Uh, they didn't um, generate enough audience appeal. Um, I don't know if there were any letters per se about about anything, uh, any any uh, criticism of their films. I just don't know. One more question. If there is. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Guy Lamolinara. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.